Hey there, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the Sunday night version of the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Harris. It's been another crazy week of football, saw some bananas performances, and pretty much every single kicker miss a crucial field goal attempt at one point or another. With me to break it all down, as always, and on his birthday, no less, is Mike Taglier. Tags, how does it feel to finally be 21 years old? <laughs> I wish I was 21 years old, man. There was... Did you have a drink? Did you celebrate? I mean, come on. To be fair, I don't think anybody would want to listen to me when I was 21 years old, though, <laughs> because I probably would have been much harsher in my takes and not such a, I wouldn't come with such a good approach. So uh, thank you for that. I really appreciate it. And Dan, by the way, I probably should have mentioned this last week, you know, when we had you host the podcast, people were probably like, wait, who's this Dan guy? By the way, if you guys don't know who Dan is, um, I, I it's my fault. I probably should have mentioned it last week. But Dan finished number 12 in the accuracy competition last year. And this is like... This is over 110 experts that we had in the competition. Dan finished number 12. He was not worse than number 37 at any of the four major positions. So Dan was very well-rounded in the competition. That's why we asked him to be the host of this show. He's going to give his input as we go on. So uh, that's who Dan is. I wanted to make sure you guys knew that. Dan's he's a rock star. That's basically where I'm coming from. I really appreciate that, Tags. And in exchange for those kind words, I'm going to tear up my I Hate Mike Teglier poster that I have right in front of me uh, as I do this podcast. But I do appreciate that tags uh, but obviously you know we're here to let's both give some some great advice going forward now look we started this podcast last week and it was my first time so I got a lot of helpful feedback from the listeners so I thought I'd just kind of go through a couple of really good tips that I got uh, before we get started number one Dan fix your mic I mean, that is duly noted. <laughs> now, something you guys may not know about me, I'm legitimately the least technologically proficient human being of all time. Uh, literally, my mother once called me over to fix her cable, and I took down power in her entire building for two hours. But after exhaustive work, and by that I mean our producers basically talking to me and saying, Dan, select option A instead of option B for your mic, I think we fixed the problem. But if we still have issues, it's obviously Tag's fault. Um, number two, um, Stop talking about fantasy football entirely and just talk about Sam Darnold and the Jets and what to expect from them over the next several years. That is not true. Now, admittedly, that's from me. I mean, that that was my sort of feedback <laughs> on the show. So I think we can probably just go ahead and skip that and tags. Maybe you and I can do like an hour long thing after the podcast is done just to sort of, you know, crack that. Um, and the third thing is more segments. Look, tags. People love segments. I did not know that. Now, this is still a recap show, so we're not going to have crazy stuff, but I'm going to throw a couple of fun things that tags his way just a little later. Haven't really given him a heads up just so we could kind of mix it up. But we're going to start with our first kind of segment, which is sort of what we did last week, although we may give a couple more, which is tags. We've had a full day of football. Give me a big takeaway that you have today. I mean, Ryan Fitzpatrick and Patrick Mahomes are competing for MVP. Um, I, I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but if you tuned in last week, that's probably what you heard as well. But uh, 19 touchdowns, man, 19 touchdowns through two ga games from these guys. And uh, the rumblings are real about Jameis Winston. Uh, he's supposed to return in week four. But I mean, after a phenomenal start to a season, it's hard to imagine that Ryan Fitzpatrick loses the starting job immediately. Uh, he's going to be on a short lease for sure. But uh, Patrick Mahomes, man, living up to the hype. There was some special throws. I mean, there's some there's some questionable decisions here and there. And uh, that's going to happen with Patrick Mahomes. He's a really young quarterback quarterback he's a, he's somewhat of the gunslinger mentality and I I think that's what we heard in the preseason him throwing interceptions in practice but uh when it comes to game time man I know that the the Steelers secondary has some a lot of moving parts to it they they were down Joe Hayden this week so it wasn't like a, a full strength Pittsburgh defense but we knew that game was going to be a shootout I think the over under on that game went up to 54 and a half uh prior to the start of the game so it was due to be a shootout he lived up to the hype and uh yeah Patrick Mahomes the real deal yeah, I believe he's the first ever quarterback to throw 10 touchdowns in this first two games of a season. And he's frankly, he's got the perfect sort of layout for just a dominant season, right? Because not only is he look completely legitimate, but he has a terrible defense that's going to provide him probably with a solid game script each week. As for Fitzpatrick, yeah, we kind of briefly touched on it last week and I asked you, are we sure Jameis Winston gets the job back? We have seen, as you pointed out last week, we've seen Ryan Fitzpatrick go on these crazy runs with the Jets a couple of years ago when they finished 10 and 6. Maybe not this, and, you know, we'll, we'll get to it. But, you know, he hosts a mediocre Steelers defense next week at Monday Night Football. If he has another huge game, yeah, I think Jameis Winston is sitting on the sidelines for a while. Uh, for me, those were obviously a couple of big things. Something else I kind of noticed, obviously, I don't know, Tags. I think Michael Thomas might be the best receiver in fantasy. 
He had another 12 receptions, 13 targets for 89 yards and two scores. Two games, 28 receptions, 30 targets for 269 yards with three touchdowns. Every single part of that stat is preposterous. The number of targets, the efficiency, the yards, the touchdowns. I mean, I thought about it this week. I wanted to get bold and maybe rank him my number one, but I'm not kidding. I think, you know, we're going to update our rest of the season rankings probably in a day or two. He might be my number one going forward. Yeah, I don't think I would, I would put him over Antonio Brown, but I, I do think that Michael Thomas deserves to be in the consideration for the number one receiver. And I mentioned that on last week's show, saying that I think the conversation next year going into redraft leagues will will be surrounding Michael Thomas. Is he the number one wide receiver off the board? I think I believe he's that good. And when you combine him with an elite quarterback like Drew Brees, now the question is, does Drew Brees start to you know take a downturn in his career because he's coming up on 40 years old really quick? And uh, as we know, quarterbacks just they, they they tumble at a certain age so that's the concern around Michael Thomas but you know when you combine his skill set with someone like Drew Brees the sky is the limit and uh, when I did my boom bust and everything in between series this offseason Michael Thomas like I know you guys can't see the career numbers behind everything because I don't publish those but Michael Thomas's career numbers as a wide receiver too you know percentage wise were just as good as Odell Beckham Julio Jones and Antonio Brown the thing is what made it so much more impressive is that Michael Thomas did it last year with those numbers while scoring minimal touchdowns. We knew that there was going to be positive touchdown regression, and Michael Thomas is showing that over the first couple weeks. And and you're I mean, if you drafted him, you're getting those dividends. Michael Thomas, I said, was a is a end of the first round draft pick. If you got him in the second round, you were stealing that's basically I still stand by that point, obviously. Yeah, and obviously, you know, there was talk about Drew Brees last year, mainly just because his fantasy numbers went down and it was really just the touchdowns. And yes, their defense was better so that he didn't have to throw quite as much. But his efficiency, I think, was better than ever. I think he had his best completion percentage ever last year. So he set the record. Right, exactly. So there could be, you know, there, you know, it, it comes quick, sort of, as you said. So if Brees sort of falls off a cliff, it could. But he has shown next to no decline as of right now. So there is little reason to doubt Michael Thomas going forward. Anything else big takeaways, tags from today that you want to talk about? I mean, I don't think uh, James Conner's not Le'Veon Bell. I think that that's something that I think people were jumping to the conclusion. And and that's not to say that James Conner's not going to be solid going forward, but um, he's just not Le'Veon Bell. He's not ever going to be Le'Veon Bell. In a game where the Steelers scored as much as they did and, and, and like, you know, they put up 37 points on the board. There was 79 points total scored in that game. Le'Veon Bell would have had a phenomenal fantasy game, whereas James Conner was very, let's say, mediocre. Yeah. Now, he look, he's still got his, and it's fair. They were down 21 nothing before he could blink, right? I mean, it was just basically over. So, obviously, but again, Bell is such a huge part of the passing game that he would factor into that. And again, I'm going to ask this every week until it happens. When do you think Le'Veon Bell is coming back? I don't think he's coming back, man. I, I continue to say it is that I, I, I don't think he's coming back till week 10. to make like So, basically, when it com- what it comes down to is like he needs to come back when it affects his free agency status. So, the reason that week 10 was always the, the the date that people talked about as a return was because basically he has to report to the team by then to accrue a year uh, on, his, on his deal. Like the, 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 the franchise tag, that's where it has to account for. So if he returns for that, the Steelers could franchise tag him again next year. Like there's like an exclusive tag that they can put on him, but that's not going to happen. He's going to be a free agent. He wants to get to that. And the, the rationale by him and his agent right now is that, yes, it's costing him $800,000 per game to sit out, but he thinks he's going to recap that money in free agency by not putting the wear and tear on his body. I don't think that's the case because if he holds out for eight or nine games, whatever it is, I mean, that's a whole lot of money. And I don't see a lot. I don't I mean, we've seen a lot of veteran running backs hit free agency and not land big money contracts. It's just a very young position. I don't know why anybody would want to spend, you know, 12 to 15 million dollars a year on Le'Veon Bell. Yeah, I agree. To me, it's a terrible decision. I'm sure he views himself and or his agent does and thinks about Todd Gurley, but he's not. He's older and he's got more wear and tear on him and he's not going to get that deal. So for me, you know, I, I'd love to see him back. But at this point, yeah, I don't see how you think it could happen before week 10. Connor is, is going to be fine. You know, the game is not going to get away from the Steelers like it does, like it did today, every single game, obviously. And I, frankly, a little bit, I was somewhat encouraged because I saw the score early and I said, oh, God, Connor might be completely fake out of this but he obviously got the early two-point conversion and then he got touch on so he's he's going to be fine in the end for me um something else that i'm sort of looking at is i'm worried about the sean watson man i mean he had a decent fantasy day overall he threw two touchdowns he had 44 yards rushing but i mean he was sacked four times that offensive line is terrible i'm really not sure he's going to make it through the entire season yeah no i i i couldn't agree more i could have said it better myself honestly 
Yeah, I again, it's it, I, if you have him, you're starting him every week. He doesn't look particularly good, but again, that offensive line is is really dreadful. So, anything else you want to talk about, Tags, before we get into it? No, man, looking forward to recapping these games. All right, good. But before we get into that, we're going to do a new segment. So let's just talk about it very briefly. Tags, I'm a major cinephile. I memorized like the Oscar winners when I was a kid and all that nonsense. So I kind of wanted to go with like a movie themed segment, right? So I was thinking about, cool, what are we going to do? And then I remember that Bobby took issue with my I'm more handsome comment that I led with last time because, to be fair, you guys don't know what I look like. That's right. Although I've appeared on the podcast with Tags and Bobby several times, I refuse to let them know what I actually look like. So instead of showing you a picture, I wanted you to know that I'm basically Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime, right? That's basically how I was going to describe what I look like. And then I was putting that all together and I said, "Mm, why why don't we make a segment out of lines from Arnold Schwarzenegger movies? So that is what I'm going to do. Look, if you can name the movie that I'm quoting, I'm going to take it easy on you. But if not, I'm going to come out swinging. Are you ready? So for our first one, this is what it is. Are you ready? It's an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Our first segment is called Who is Your Daddy and What Does He Do? The Terminator. No, not the Terminator, man. Who is your daddy and what does he do? Do you think a robot from the future is good? No, it's not. No, it's not. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I got it. Hold on. It is. um, Hold on. It is uh, the one where he's a a teacher. Um, Ooh. Oh, my God. Kindergarten cop. Oh, thank goodness you got it. Exactly. If you guys haven't seen it, you are missing out on one of the great cinematic classics of all time. (laughs) A gruff police officer has to teach kindergarten in his undercover role. You've got to get there. So basically, (laughs) who is your daddy and what does he do? So basically, when Pedro Martinez, I'm a big baseball fan. I do a lot of baseball running. When Pedro Martinez was pitching against the Yankees, he they just crushed him for like a number of things around. He said, I just need to tip my hat and call them my daddy. And then every time he went and pitched it in Yankee Stadium, they would jeer him with cheers of who's your daddy. So basically what I'm going to do here is pick out a few guys that so far have way surpassed where you had them in your rest of season rankings, at least as of your last update, whose performances today have been just so far better. Basically, you know, they've been your daddy and see if they've changed your mind yet. Now, by the way, I just to be clear, I've got like 40 of these lined up for future episodes in terms of Arnold Schwarzenegger lines. <laughs> I will gladly skip if you guys want, because I can do any movie you want. But, you know, keep it clean if you're going to make any suggestions. So yeah, with, with Arnold, I wouldn't consider it great cinematic experience. I'm more of a comedy guy myself rather than the uh, the Arnold movies. But uh, I, I could try and hang. I don't really know if I can talk to you anymore, but let's finish this podcast and then maybe you can find a new co-host, okay? Because we'll figure it all out. Let's do it. All right, so let's start with a couple of guys. You mentioned this guy already, but Patrick Mahomes is obviously going absolutely crazy. Now, coming into this week, you and I both updated our rest of season rankings earlier this week. You had him 14th as the 14th ranked quarterback coming in. What are you doing with him after this? Oh, he's going up 100%. How high? Honestly, I need to look at the schedule. I'm not going to hold you. I'm not going to hold you to it, obviously, but I just mean generally. You know, I I just pull up the schedule just to see kind of where he's going. So next week, he's at home against the 49ers. Not a bad matchup at all. Um, After that, he's going to go to Denver and play the Broncos. That could be one of the rough matchups, you know, playing a mile high against that pass rush. Uh, The Steelers, by the way, I don't. I don't want to take anything away from Patrick Mahomes, uh, like his game today, but the Steelers defense just looked terrible. They, they didn't look good last week either, but missing Joe Hayden this week with a new safety duo there, there's just a, there's a lot of moving parts there. Um, you know, over the middle of the field, missing Ryan Shazier, that changed the run defense. So the, the entire makeup of that team is like shifting. So I don't, I don't want to take too much away, but at the same time, you have the Broncos. So in, in week four, you have the Broncos, and then week five, you have the Jaguars. I don't think you want to play him in either of those matchups. So it's tough, right? So the, the way that I approach quarterbacks rest of season is like, do I do I picture them as an every week starter or do I picture them as a streamer? And that's really what it comes down to, because if you if they're if they're a streamer, okay, it is what it is, and I'm not going to trade something crazy for them. And knowing that he's got two of his next three matchups in, in really tough spots, I'm not going to trade and pay top price for him. Um, he is going to move up in my rankings for sure. He's going to be considered one of the best streamers. And, and when people hear that, they think like, oh, he's not in QB1 territory. No, 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 no. I just There's like basically four or five quarterbacks that I view as every single week starters and everybody else is streamers. That's how I approach the quarterback position. So if you have Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, um, I, I suppose that you could put Cam Newton, Tom Brady and those uh, Drew Brees in the conversation. Those are like the top five. Outside of them, it's like I want to play the matchups, right? Mahomes is er, he's moving his way up. Um, I, I don't want to say that he's a great start against the Broncos or the Jags, though. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that all of that is fair. And again, I try to underreact best I can. It's a long season. You don't want to go crazy. But I can't imagine that I'm going to have Mahomes outside of the must-start territory going forward. I mean, what he's doing is is insane. I mean, you know, and I get all, all you know, these tough defenses. That's fine. Right now, I mean, especially given his legs, I can't imagine any scenario where I'm thinking about sending him. So my guess is when we update it, and again, we do it, and then, you know, I'm sure um, we'll tweet it out. The rest of season rankings, my guess is I'm going to have him high. I'm not. I'm not going to sit here and say I'm definitely going to have him top five, but he's going to be right there. He's. I, I'm almost positive he's going to be top seven. And I, you know, I don't know, man. He's just. There's nothing I look at him that makes me worry about him at all. Pretty much at this point, the weapons are, are nasty, and that defense is going to allow him to take a lot of passing attempts. And this week, it was like uh, they actually had less passing attempts than they're usually going to. So it's like, that's the weird part is they were really up in this game. So he didn't even have to do much if he didn't, you know, like he was just so efficient that he didn't really need to throw a whole bunch. Cause like, what did he wind up with passing attempt wise? Like I, I'm going to pull it up right now. He ended up with 28 pass attempts. Like what? Yeah. He threw six touchdowns on 28 pass attempts. Right. Well, that's the thing, man. And again, he has, he's got great weapons and, you know, with a game that where he basically had a positive game script, he still just delivered a massive performance. So Wait, let me ask you a question. Patrick Mahomes or Deshaun Watson the rest of the season? Uh, I honestly, I think Mahomes. I mean, I, I think if you would ask me that last week and I said, is there any chance you're going to have Mahomes over Watson the following week? I would have said probably not, but I just did not. I do not like what I see from Deshaun Watson. Again, that line is just terrible. Now, look, the, the Chiefs line is terrible too. I mean, it, it's really not impressive, but I just, I have more faith at this point in Mahomes. So for me, I'm, don't hold me to it if my rest of the season rankings have Deshaun Watson one spot higher maybe, but I think right now I'll take Mahomes. I'm, I'm completely buying into this performance. Yeah, it's close. That's why I'm going to ask you that one. Yeah, no, I agree. The other one, obviously, this guy's much lower end, but I want to know, you know, Andy Dalton, for so far in two games, he's on pace for over 4,000 yards passing. He already has six touchdowns. He had him 21st coming in. Now I get it. You're not going to be starting Andy Dalton in any sort of one quarterback league or anything like that. But are you going to be moving him up? And if so, significantly after the big game against Baltimore? It's really tough for me to do that. Um, like just when you look at the names ahead of him, like Carson Wentz looks like he's going to be coming back next week. That's obviously massive because I don't think that anybody would take Andy Dalton over Carson Wentz. Uh, Trubisky has shown a rushing floor. Uh, that's like that's the, the the area of the rankings where it's kind of like it's smoky. And I'm going to watch Mitch uh, on, on Monday night against the Seahawks to see you know if he could take a step forward because I believe he looked really good in the first half last week and then second half he just looked terrible. So there's like I think there's a middle ground here and I think Mitch is going to be fine. Uh, Tyrod Taylor, I mean the rushing floor that he presents I think the ceiling is as high as Dalton's any given week Matt Ryan obviously showed you that he was capable again this week Jared Goff like which of these names are you going to put Andy Dalton over that's where I'm at like I'll put Andy Dalton over Marcus Mariota Dak Prescott and like that tier but to to put him any higher than that it's really tough I think 18 is probably as high as I could possibly go yeah, no, I do agree with you there. I, you know, a lot of people have actually been asking because Dalton was a guy, look, he he looks great so far. And it was in prime time on Thursday, which was really crazy given his record. But yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think I had him right around where you did. I'm going to move him up, but it's not going to be, you know, significant. Um, and he still falls way outside. You know, it would have to be one of the the massive bye weeks. Um, for me to think about starting him. Uh, going to running backs for you, Chris Thompson. And this is a guy that I am particularly, uh, I think, I've been high on pretty much before the season started. Now, through two games, he has only 66 yards rushing, but he has 155 yards receiving. He's more valuable in PPR. You had him 30th in standard. Is that where he's staying for you after this big game? Man, it's really tough. I didn't think Chris Thompson would have a good week this week because basically game script, I thought it was going to be against him. And um, it, it was totally opposite of that. You know, Adrian Peterson didn't get many carries. And when he did, he didn't do much with them. Like it was like the Redskins, just the game plan was terrible against the Colts. And they, even though they fell behind, it wasn't like a, a game that was out of reach. So I didn't feel like they needed to abandon the run because the Colts linebackers like had combined for 220 some snaps uh, in their careers. So why not? continue to run Adrian Peterson into that line. Um, but the game obviously went into a, a place that I didn't think it would. So I am going to have to move him up. Uh, Chris Thompson was always someone that I was slowly moving up my rankings, the more healthy I was able to see him. And now that we've seen him in back-to-back weeks being used heavily by Alex Smith, uh, you have to trust him. Um, like, you know, looking at guys like Royce Freeman, whose snap count was a bu- like lower than it should have been this week. Uh, looking at guys like, you know, maybe Marshawn Lynch, where the game script isn't going to fit in. Those are the guys that you, you might want to consider putting Chris Thompson ahead of. So he's going to move up. It's just a question of which players do I put him in front of? Yeah, I think that's fair. I think I had him a little higher than you did, but I think I'm going to have him as a 
pretty firm RB2, like a low-end one, but a firm RB2 even in standard. It, you know, just for me, I mean, we'll talk about Adrian Peterson, but he obviously did not look particularly impressive in this game. Um, I really think that their offense kind of flows through Chris Thompson at this point, and I, I think that he's going to really thrive with Alex Smith under center. And again, it's health for him. If you could guarantee me that he would be healthy for 16 games, I, I'd have him, you know, probably in the very low teens honestly because I, I love the guy I think he every time he touches the ball he's a home run threat so I I really have been excited about him since the early reports frankly um, in the preseason that it, he seemed to be much more ahead of schedule and everything looked good and I'm really excited by him coming in um, the other running back I wanted to ask you about Austin Eckler you had him 47th coming in and this is a day that we had a positive game script right I mean he this is a day that's not supposed to favor him coming in but he still puts up 98 total yards I mean 47th in standard tags are you going to move him up towards at least maybe borderline RB3 range or are you keeping him down there I was low on Eckler the reason I was is because if you go in through and look at the snap counts in week one it, it basically came down to like he was getting touches sure um, but he only played 22 snaps in, in week one and like like going into this week, I had I had a feeling that Austin Eckler that he was going to move up in people's rankings after this week just because they're playing the Bills, a team that allowed each running back on the Ravens to score a touchdown last week. And then going back to last year, I think they allowed 15 rushing touchdowns in their last 11 games. So it's like this team has been terrible. And I, I figured Eckler was going to get some garbage time. And he kind of did. And Melvin Gordon reportedly, uh, it was some knee issue. And I was watching that game as it happened. And he was kind of twisted awkwardly. And I think they were in, in like they had a handle on the game. The question is, was it a real injury or was it just like, did we pull him out in order to, because it was garbage time, we gave Eckler more snaps. I, I believe Eckler is a handcuff still. I still believe that. I, but I do think that he's got more value than I think any of us initially anticipated. Because, I mean, if the Chargers plan on going far into the playoffs, they're going to need Melvin Gordon to remain healthy. So they might continue to split the workload because Eckler has looked really good on his touches. Yeah, absolutely. He's effective whenever he's in the game. They can't, you know, run Melvin Gordon into the ground. And they like, you know, I know it's been different offensive coordinators and all that, but they like having the pass catching back. I think he is a guy who has value specifically in PPR leagues. But I think if you are in a pin, in some week you can start him as sort of an RB3 in a standard league and you know I, I really I was I was happy again yeah Melvin Gordon with the minor injury which as far as I heard was minor and obviously the, the game was well in hand from basically kickoff so they didn't really need to push anything but I do think that he's a guy who if he's out there in your league he's really not a bad guy to own more so than just a handcuff as somebody who could provide certainly positive value uh, more weeks than not. The only other guy I want to ask you about tags is Quincy Anunua. Now, this is a guy that you and I were pretty far apart on um, coming in. I think you had him 74th in your rest of season rankings. Another 11 targets, 7 catches for 92 yards. He's now got 15 catches on 21 targets for 155 yards and a touchdown. Are you buying into this at all? Yeah, that's on me for not moving him up further than I should have. After he saw 10 of 21 targets uh, from Sam Darnold, I, I, I definitely wanted to move him up, and I don't know why I didn't move him up to where I wanted to. I probably put him would have put him around the wide receiver 50 mark and then after this week I'm actually higher on him than even then because the thing is is like it, the matchup wasn't great against Minka Fitzpatrick because they had him covering the slot but Anunwa is just shown he's like a reliable set of hands and he should have had a touchdown today if you guys didn't see that game Quincy Anunwa was wide open and the right like so Darnold rolled out left and Anunwa was wide open in the right side of the end zone he threw it there and Anunwa I, I actually think he came down with that ball but he was out of bounds um, wide open like it was just a bad throw by Darnold so so uh, Quincy Nunwa has shown up as his favorite target. I think Robbie Anderson only got like three targets today. Terrell Pryor caused an interception. He acknowledged this after the game. So like these receivers aren't doing themselves any favors. So Quincy Nunwa is fast, like quickly moving up my receiver rankings. And honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if I put him inside the top 40 going forward. Yeah, 100 percent. I had him 49th. And by the way, just so you know, as someone who also does rest of season rankings, guys like this happen all the time where you just kind of miss them. You know, you, you have a guy at a spot and you just you don't always catch them when you're making your your moves up. I had him about 49th. So basically where you figure you would have had him if you were really thinking about it. And I agree. I think he's going up. He's obviously the target. Robbie Anderson has been barely targeted in either of the two games. Terrell Pryor, as you said, really just not a particularly good football player. So I agree. I think he's going to be moving up, and he's certainly got a target, certainly in PPR leagues. Now, Tags, before we keep going, I had a pretty cool day today, buddy. You know what I did? I went to the Mets-Red Sox game with my boy. I'm from Queens. I'm a big Mets fan. We live in New England, so it was a pretty cool day. My son really, really loved it. But you know what the downside was? I barely got to watch any of the 1 o'clock games. <laughs> it was really annoying, and I was getting texts and alerts on my phone and trying to watch it on my phone. 
but I really couldn't do much about that. So what do you think I'm going to do about that, Tags? You're going to ask me about them. No, I am going to ask you about them, but then you know what I'm going to do tomorrow? I'm going to spend my entire day watching NFL Game Pass yeah, because buddy. if you're like me and you need to basically replay every NFL game, then there's really only one place to do that, and that is NFL Game Pass. In addition to watching Sam Darnold miss Quincy and Nunwa on a wide-open throw tomorrow, I'm going to be checking out Ryan Fitzpatrick throwing the bunch of touchdown passes, huge ones, to Deshaun Jackson and OJ Howard. I'm going to look at Keelan Cole apparently impersonating Odell Beckham making one-handed grabs and Kirk Cousins destroying the Packers. I know what you're thinking. Dan, it's going to take you a lot of time to watch every game. That is a fair point, but here's the best part. You can watch the full broadcast version commercial-free if you want. You can watch the coaches' film, which uses the all-22 angle that the pros and coaches use, or you can do the condensed game version, which is 45 minutes for the game. With the NFL Game Pass, it is game time anytime. And best of all, you can kick off the 2018 NFL season with a seven-day free trial of NFL Game Pass. Sign up right now at NFL.com slash Fantasy Pros. That's NFL.com slash Fantasy Pros. All right, Tags, let's get into the game recaps, and let's very briefly again touch on the Thursday night game. We don't have to get into it too much. Bengals 34, Ravens 23. I wanted to point out one thing for you because I've been I've been hitting you and saying, move these guys up, move these guys up, look at all this stuff. At 8 19 p.m on thursday which is right before the game starts okay tags tweeted out the following quote taking a quick look at yahoo ownership numbers right now and if you have a player on your bench that you're not attached to john brown is just 22 percent owned this is criminal even for 10 team leagues you don't have to play him tonight but snag him for your bench and boom brilliant advice as always he has a big game 92 yards and a touchdown we had him both around the 47th ranked wide receiver rest of season before the game where do you think he's going after this yeah, um, John Brown, it's it's tough to move him over guys like Robert Woods, Kenny Stills, like Anunwa territory, which is where I'm probably going to end up with him uh, because Michael Crabtree is there. But John Brown is a fantastic receiver. Um, he's always been. It's just a matter. It's been a matter of health. And to know that Joe Flacco has been connecting with him and not just on a deep ball level, but in the red zone, like John Brown actually should have had two touchdowns in that game. There was one that kind of went through his hands. Um, so he, I think he was let down after that. But at the same time, he's a top 50 wide receiver for the rest of the season. And again, he. I could not believe when I was going through that and I saw 22% owned like that's 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 criminal man Uh, because even if you're in 12 team leagues with like two man benches you'd want one wide receiver and one running back and John Brown should be owned in that league and I know leagues are obviously bigger than that so uh, John Brown if he's available it's he should be owned. Yeah, I completely agree. He's been a favorite of both of ours. Um, last year, we talked about it a lot, and obviously, he just battles health. So if he can stay healthy, I agree. I mean, it, it, you can't get him too high, right? I mean, he did only catch four of his 10 targets, so he's not exactly the most efficient guy. But he's certainly a guy to take a look at. You should own him, and he can be started uh, in a uh, when you have a little bit of a pinch at wide receiver. Are you concerned at all about Alex Collins here? Obviously, game script wasn't perfectly in his favor, and he did get a goal line touch, but Buck Allen is a thing, apparently. Yeah, there's a lot of people talking about it after the game saying that, well, Alex Collins was never going to be a workhorse and blah, blah. Well, I mean, if you look over like the last two months of the season last year, Alex Collins was being used more in the passing game. Buck Allen was actually, he was healthy during that time. So there was little reason to doubt the fact that he should have had more work. Um, Kenneth Dixon coming back was always my biggest concern, but knowing Kenneth Dixon has a knee injury and he's going to miss time. I'm not totally worried about Alex Collins, but he kind of fits in this group of just guys. Um, Like, it's no longer of like, he's outside the tier of like guys that you must start every week. If it's a bad matchup, don't feel the need that you have to play Alex Collins because I didn't, I didn't feel like it was a bad matchup against the Bengals. I mean, they were without Vontae's perfect. So, I mean, we saw Naheem Hines and Jordan Wilkins put up respectable fantasy performances in week one. So I felt like Alex Collins was a safe play this week. I had him ranked as an RB2, but knowing that they're going to use Buck Allen similar to the way that they did at the start of last season and that Alex Collins is on a short leash with his fumbling. Yeah, there's definitely concern there. And he kind of falls into that maybe high end RB three that you want to play in good matchups. Yeah, I think I'll probably have him higher than you. Now, part of it is that I think that I'm probably a little enamored of his actual football skill. I love watching him and I love when he breaks. He does not get the work that I feel like he really needs to. What really was encouraging for me, at least, is that, first of all, he did not fumble. And any day that Alex Collins does not fumble is a good day. And two, he still got a goal line touch. I know uh, Buck Allen converted his, but even after that, he did get a goal line touch and was brought down right before the goal. If he's going to get those, he's going to really improve. So I probably like him a little more than you. I think I'll still have him as probably closer to you know a low-end RB2, but, a, but probably a solid one at that. Um, I think that's it. I'm sure you guys will talk about Gio Bernard uh, tomorrow in terms of the waiver wire and everything like that. So let's move on to today's games. Uh, Falcons 31, Panthers 24, report. 
reports of Matt Ryan's demise were greatly exaggerated. He had a huge week, 23 of 28 for 272 with two touchdowns, and I believe two rushing touchdowns, unless I saw that wrong. So that is... Oh, he did. <laughs> that is pretty good. Now he's hosting the Saints next week, and despite their you know decent defensive performance um, against the uh, Browns today, it's obviously a good matchup for Ryan. Um, and obviously, Tevin Coleman, uh, you know, he's filling in for Devonta Freeman, did about what you would expect. Uh, 16 for 107, four catches for 18. So any big takeaways on the Atlanta side of the ball? Oh, no, obviously just to uh, pay attention to Tevin Coleman, because like uh, if Devonta Freeman, there's rumors that he's going to miss two to four weeks uh, with this knee injury. Tevin Coleman is obviously a must play every single week to know that he got it done today in a tough matchup. This was a brutal matchup against Carolina. I think there was one game last year where Carolina allowed a running back more than 17 PPR points. And Tevin Coleman basically got to that point on just four targets in the passing game. So um, Tevin Coleman must play every week that uh, Devonta Freeman is out. And if that's two to four weeks, he's obviously must play Calvin Ridley. I think he showed today what he can do. If Julio Jones is basically the focal point of the defense where it's like, if they, they say, okay, we're going to take away Julio. Can someone else beat us? And Calvin Ridley did that consistently uh, four catches for 64 yards and a touchdown. The thing is, is if this offense, if they call the offense correctly in the red zone, it could be dangerous, but we, as we've seen, that's not something you want to trust. <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely. And obviously Julio, you know, rather pedestrian effort, five catches on nine targets for 64 yards, but it's going to happen when the defense decides that they're just going to take him away. Sometimes they're going to actually be able to do that. Sometimes it's not going to matter because he can beat, you know, whatever you throw at him. But these games are going to happen. So obviously nothing to worry about. And as we said, going up against the Saints next week should be a fine game. Uh, on the Panther side of the ball, look, this game was set up perfectly sort of for Christian McCaffrey out of the passing game. Both Deion Jones and Keanu Neal, they were the primary defenders on about half of running back snap targets last year. So, of course, he doesn't do much on the ground. Eight for 37, I mean, that's fine. But 14 of 15 targets for 102 yards. Um, that's basically what he's going to be able to do in the right matchup. Anything going on here from the Panther side of the ball? No, I think Christian McCaffrey went back into his role that he had last year, essentially. And C.J. Anderson, by the way, did nothing to uh, add to his role because, yes, he had three carries for 31 yards, but he also uh, he had a target that bounced off his arms and was picked off. Uh, so that obviously didn't help Cam Newton's stat line get that one interception. That was on C.J. Anderson. Uh, so he didn't do anything to, to garner a bigger role in the passing game. And so McCaffrey, with Greg Olson out, he's going to get tons of receptions. Options. Like he's going to be a PPR monster the rest of the year. Not much to take away from there. Cam Newton, by the way, looked like he was concussed in that game. Uh, they did. They did check him out on the sideline, which I mean, I understand they have their checks and all that stuff and they'll tell us whatever they'll tell us. But uh, Cam Newton's arms went up like he was like when you see someone concussed and like knocked out on the field. That's how it looked. Um, but he did come back and he played a significant he played better like <laughs> he completed more passes he threw for better yards per attempt he threw three touchdowns like everything looked better so maybe Cam Newton getting hit was the best thing for him yeah 335 yards passing and three touchdowns plus the 42 yards rushing yeah I mean I'm terrified with Cam and I am every year coming in and I feel like I always don't rank him appropriately coming in because I'm just terrible because I feel like it looks like he suffers a concussion once every, you know, two or three games, you know, and somehow he survives. That was a dirty hit, though. Like the, the hit that he took, like, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but it, I was, have. it was dirty and the player was ejected for it. Uh, deservedly so. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. But thankfully, he looks healthy right now. He did have a big game and they they'll take on the Bengals next week. Chargers 31, Bills 20 in a game that was not as close as that final score suggested. And things got so bad for the Bills that apparently Vontae Davis retired at halftime. Yes, that's that's the only takeaway from this game. Like, you, you guys knew exactly how this game was going to play out. But the fact that Vontae Davis retired, like legitimately retired at halftime. He quit on his team. Um, he tweeted out something afterward. I, I didn't see how this was ending my career. Dude, stop it. Stop it. Yeah. Ugh, it's terrible. terrible. Terrible, terrible. But Phillip Rivers, 23 for 27 for 256 yards three touchdowns this game exactly as tag said when exactly uh as kind of everybody saw it going now the one thing i will say is i think LaShawn mccoy uh got banged up in this game i think maybe his knee he was nine for 39 plus four catches for 29 yards but he was hobbling badly after the game i don't know if you've heard any info on that so i saw the play he was hurt on um LaShawn mccoy i was watching that one and uh he he had a run he came down and everything was fine but the offensive line when it was shoved down on him and it looked like he came down on LaShawn mccoy's hip like like all of his weight came down on LaShawn McCoy's hip and I was worried that he like broke something I don't know what would happen uh, but if he's hobbling around after the game that doesn't surprise me because it, it didn't look like it was good um, I was really worried that it was something extremely bad LaShawn McCoy could have had a better game he actually looked pretty solid in the, in the carries that he did get but yeah it didn't look good during the game 
Well, obviously, if he's out next week, then Chris Ivory is probably going to make an RB1 at the Vikings, right? I mean, that's... Don't waste any money on that, seriously. Do not at all, especially against the Vikings, but no, do not. Just move on, and frankly, I'm having trouble, other than McCoy, obviously, if he's healthy, seeing any Bills player worth even looking at whatsoever. Um, Oh, God, Vikings 29, Green Bay 29, another tie, which is... uh, pretty terrible um dalvin cook left this game in overtime with a knee injury again we are recording this sunday night tags i don't know if you've heard anything about the severity of it i have not um dalvin cook did look pretty good during this game and i was actually going to tell people to buy him because i felt like i don't think that he looked bad i think the offensive line looked terrible the matchups that they had like green bay didn't look terrible uh against the run this week but dalvin cook looks explosive i think he looked fine um but the thing is is like if that, there's an injury to a knee, that's not a good thing, you know, for someone coming off an ACL. So we obviously want to pay attention to that. But this game, it was closer than I thought it would be with Aaron Rodgers at less than 100%. Uh, he was sacked four times, uh, but Aaron Rodgers looked like Aaron Rodgers when throwing the ball. He only had the one touchdown, but there should have been two. Uh, one was a Jimmy Graham touchdown that was called back for some sort of penalty. Uh, and then Devontae Adams dropped a second touchdown but it was, uh, it was a very Aaron Rodgers-esque game against the Vikings. It's, it was a tough matchup, but Kirk Cousins going for 425-4, and four, seeing Adam Thielen and Stephon Diggs both get it done. That was one of the notes I was actually going to mention at the top of the show was that one part where I might have been wrong in my offseason research and analysis is that I was betting on Stephon Diggs, and that's turning out to be right, but I also bet against Adam Thielen because I didn't think both of them could be top 15 receivers, and I'm being proven wrong here. Um, Adam Thielen and Stephon Diggs are, man – that's a one-two punch right there. Absolutely. If you can basically get any piece of this offense, uh, you got to go do it. Even Kyle Rudolph, frankly, who has mostly been kind of a touchdown dependent tight end, seven of eight targets for 72 yards. I mean, it, you know, Cousins looked awesome today, and it was a it was a really enjoyable game to watch other than the tie at the end. And again, just to say something on Cook, because I don't know what word is going to be out. I, it, there wasn't anything apparent. It wasn't like that I saw. I didn't see him. You know, I don't think he went down with a knee injury or anything like that. I just heard that he was removed from overtime while I was watching. So, uh, you know, for now, certainly nothing to panic about, but I'm sure there'll be more word. As for the Packers, I mean, uh, pedestrian numbers again for Jamal Williams. Uh, he had zero missed tackles last week. I, I haven't seen the numbers this week, but my guess is it's probably not much more than that. What sort of role is Aaron Jones going to have when he gets back? I don't know, man, because the thing is with Aaron Rodgers hobbled, I think it hurts Aaron Jones more than anything because Jamal Williams is considered a great pass blocker. And we saw it against the Bears. Like he made a key block towards the end of that game. And I know a lot of people are like, oh my God, how much are we, how much value are we going to put into pass blocking for running backs? And it's overrated and this and that. If Mike McCarthy cares, then that's what matters. And the fact that Aaron Rodgers is hobbled right now, and I don't think that his knee is going to be 100% anytime soon, I think Jamal Williams is going to continue to see the majority of snaps because Ty Montgomery is not going to all of a sudden disappear. Jamal Williams is the best pass blocker, and Aaron Jones is coming off a two game suspension. And he didn't like light the world on fire in the preseason. So uh, Aaron Jones, I, I do believe there's some point in the season that he might just take over this job, but not right now. I think that's a really, really, really good point. Because, again, the thing with Rodgers is it's not like Rodgers is, okay, he's going to battle through it, and then next week he's going to be fine. All the reports out of this is this is going to bother him for several weeks. And, again, you saw him. If you saw him tonight, he obviously lacks mobility, and the most important thing is going to be protecting him. And so if Jamal Williams thrives in that area, that's really all he's going to need to kind of keep his role. So that's really a good point. Um, Titans 20, Texans 17. I mean, look, Mariota, I believe, was active for this game, but it was all Blaine Gabbert. Mariota didn't play at all. He didn't play at all, but he was active, oddly enough, for the game, I believe. But um, obviously, so, I, you know, is there anything that you can take away from the Titans side of the ball with Blaine Gabbert, other than they somehow won? Uh, I don't know how they won. <laughs> Jadavian Clowney didn't play. He was inactive, which helped. Tennessee didn't run the ball particularly well. Uh, Derrick Henry and Deion Lewis combined for 32 carries and uh, 98 yards. Like, it was, they didn't run the ball well. They didn't throw the ball particularly well, but they somehow pulled it out. I mean, there was the special teams. It was a fake punt. I want to say uh, when I was watching, they had a fake punt that was for a touchdown. That turns out to be, I think, the game winner there. But yeah, it, it was it was a weird game. Deshaun Watson, little hit or miss, and I, I know people will look at his line and say three ten, two touchdowns. The one touchdown to Will Fuller, it was a great play on Will Fuller's part. And uh, there were there were just a few bonehead plays in there where Deshaun Watson he does throw up these hail marys that is just like he's throwing up 50 50 balls and the the fact that he has uh, DeAndre Hopkins and Will Fuller out there help matters obviously, but sometimes he's going to be made to look particular like kind of dumb um but Deshaun Watson I'm not I'm not buying this as like oh he's okay and this game made me feel so much better about him it didn't get there 
No, absolutely. And as I said, kind of at the top of the show, it made me feel worse because I just do not like like what he's doing right now. I hate that offensive line. Um, I really, I'll, I'm going to be surprised at this point if he makes it um, through the entire season healthy. Lamar Miller, 14 for 68. That's basically what you're going to get from Lamar Miller going forward. That offensive line is bad. It'll give you about four yards of carry, and that's that's pretty much it. All right, Saints 21, Browns 18, <laughs> narrowly, narrowly, narrowly missing. The Browns just did everything they could to not win that game. Boy, I feel very bad for Zane Gonzalez, but, you know, that's what it, it's uh, it's the life of a kicker. What do you want? Now, obviously, before this game ever started, the big news was Josh Gordon released, to be released. Now it sounds like he's going to be traded. Um, that obviously has a big impact. And again, people, myself included, kind of expected maybe Antonio Callaway would step up. And indeed he did. He did three of four for 81 yards and a touchdown. Both of us had him outside our top 100 coming in. Obviously he was not at all on the fantasy radar. What do you think he's going to be going forward? Callaway is still the number three. Uh, he's behind Landry and Richard Higgins. Richard Higgins caught, uh, he has he actually saw seven targets. He caught five of them for 47 yards this week. Um, Callaway is going to be the number three. So he's going to be a part-time player in an offense that I don't think they're throwing as much as people thought that they were going to. And uh, in a game like this, they could have used someone like Josh Gordon. Like seriously, um, Jarvis Landry is not a number one receiver. Like the fact that Josh Gordon was on the field even last week, it, it helped take away attention from Jarvis Landry. And I don't think that I don't think they're gonna like life without Josh Gordon. And I, I don't know if this means they're gonna sign uh, Des Bryant, but um, someone said that basically you're gonna replace one problem with another. And I I mean, why would they bring him in for a visit if they didn't even contemplate signing Des Bryant? So I think that there's really there's thought there. I don't know if it's gonna be a trade because they've talked about that, uh, or if they're just gonna release him. So. I don't know, man. Antonio Callaway is going to be really hit or miss. Uh, it was one big play. It was a 47-yard touchdown that made his day because before that, it was nothing. It was like 30-some yards, no touchdown, two catches. So it was just an average day. Um, but he did catch – it was at the very end of the, the fourth – quarter he caught a long touchdown pass it was a beautiful pass by Tyrod Taylor it was a good catch by him but I'm not gonna envision him as an every week starter or anything like that yeah I think that's fair and what about on the running side 16 for 43 with uh, a score for Carlos Hyde but I mean that's obviously nothing to get excited about is Nick Chubb gonna start getting the ball more or what I don't think so I think this is Carlos Hyde's backfield and that was one of the another one of my notes was that Duke Johnson's gonna move down in my rankings because Duke Johnson has 11 touches through two games and Carlos Hyde has 40 of them so they're giving him the lion's share of the work and knowing that they're playing the Jets on Thursday night this week I do envision it's in Cleveland too so I, I think this is a game where Cleveland could win I don't think the offensive line for the Jets can hold uh, the pass rush of Agunjabi and uh, and Miles Garrett so it's just going to be nasty for Sam Darnold he's going to have to get the ball out quick um, Cleveland has shown the ability to hang with, with potent offenses I mean they just played against the Saints at home and then they played against the Steelers obviously Roethlisberger is not as good on the road but they've looked really good so um, I think Carlos Hyde couldn't he can raise his stock next week because the game script fits him now granted the, the Browns have been leading in the last two games and then they lose because that's what happens when you have bad coaching but um, Carlos Hyde is obviously the guy who's they, they want to be the guy and I there's no reason to think that he shouldn't be going forward yeah I'm um, Duke Johnson absolutely i didn't really understand. I mean, I know he had a fine season last year, but Isaiah Crow was terrible. And so I think they were just going to whatever alternative is. He had five touches for 10 yards this game. You can move on for as far as I'm concerned in all formats. Um, and again, I, Hyde is the guy, but he just he looks incredibly unimpressive to me. And I, I kind of just wish that they would give Chubb more of a more of a run. But again, that's uh, I'm certainly not the coach. And I think I can be thankful for that. Um, on the Saints side of the ball, we basically talked about pretty much everything. The one thing I do want to say is, I don't know about you, Tags. I was a little worried that Mark Ingram may take a little while to get going when he does come back after his suspension, that they might ease him in or something like that. But I think if anything's been made clear, it's that they really need to have a guy who's just sort of more of a pure runner because Kamara's really doesn't get it done as much just as the pure runner. He's great at the backfield. But I think, if anything, the first couple of games have just basically increased uh, Mark Ingram's stock. Do you agree with that? I do. I think uh, Alvin Kamara, by the way, career high in carries, 13 for 46. So it wasn't like an impressive day. But Alvin Kamara didn't look bad, though. So like, don't look at that and think he was, it looked bad because he actually did what he could with the room he was given. Like Alvin Kamara is just – he's one of those guys where it's just like he's never cleanly tackled and like he's hard to bring down. There was a touchdown he had that was overturned. It was brought back uh, due to a penalty. I can't even remember what penalty it was. There's just so many things that go on in a day. It's hard for me to keep track in my mind. Um, but basically, Mark Ingram is a type of guy where if you can trade Le'Veon 
Bell to get Mark Ingram, I would do it. I uh, think that that is correct, honestly. And again, Kamara, to the extent you were disappointed with today, I mean, again, he had 99 yards from scrimmage. It's perfectly acceptable. If that's a bad game for Alvin Kamara, I'll I'll take it any day of the week. Uh, Dolphins 20, Jets 12, the worst game of the entire year. Um, Again, not too much to take from it, as far as I could tell. Uh, Tags, if you have anything specifically that you want to talk about here. Yeah, the Dolphins-Jets game, it was... It was somewhat of a letdown in terms of like the Jets, what I expected from Sam Darnold against that defense. I didn't think they were spectacular. The biggest thing is that Isaiah Crowell and Bilal Powell, it was another timeshare uh, because from week one, it was hard to to grasp what the timeshare was going to be between those two. But I can tell you after um, looking at everything, uh, Bilal Powell finished with 34 snaps, Isaiah Crowell 31. So it's it's a full-blown timeshare. So you basically have to play game script into it. Um, and Bilal Powell, unfortunately, like, well, in terms of if you're an Isaiah Crowell owner, Bilal Powell is going to be the one who's probably going to be the one scoring the majority of points because, like, targets in the passing game are worth more than carries and Bilal Powell saw six targets today while Crowell I think saw two of them uh maybe three uh but Powell is the better pass catcher so if uh, you're in a negative game script he's the one who's going to be there more often so uh we Isaiah Crowell we saw his floor today this is basically why I didn't want to draft Isaiah Crowell he had 35 yards in the ground four yards receiving that is the type of performance that kills your fantasy team right yeah, and Powell, again, he should have a, a fairly decent floor given his pass catching ability. He had five catches on six targets, 74 yards, and a score. So he's going to be involved more often than not. Um, on the Miami side of the ball, there's really nothing to take from it as far as I could tell. Kenny Stills is going to have games like this. He's going to just not be involved. Kenyon Drake obviously led the way. Frank Gore just had nine for 25. So to the extent you were worried about Gore really eating into Kenyon Drake's work, I mean, he's going to get carries. He's going to get touches. But again, Kenyon Drake is obviously the the main force in that backfield and he's going to be pretty much a reliable to me you know mid or low tier uh, rb2 going forward chiefs 42 steelers 37 and we have touched on this game uh, quite a bit so what about sammy Watkins? i mean again a guy who i've always kind of liked and was frustrated last year he had six for 100 plus a 31 yard rush do you think they're going to try to get him more involved consistently going forward sammy Watkins looked really good um like tyreek hill does make him look slow <laughs> Which is really quite odd because like it's it's hard to make Sammy Watkins look slow, uh, but Tyreek Hill is just he's blazing fast. Um, but Sammy Watkins did receive one more target than Tyreek Hill this week. Uh, I know Chris Conley and Demarcus Robinson got into the end zone, but I think it's only a matter of time before Sammy Watkins starts getting those touchdowns. He looked really really good today. I love the way that they're using him. They are lining him up in the slot like they had talked about. That's going to create mismatches for him. Um, yeah, there's going to be a whole lot of days for Sammy in this offense with how much they're scoring, with how bad the defense is. Just, just there's a so much goodness here Sammy was one of my favorite sleeper plays of the week so to know he put up 100 yards through the air and then another 31 on the ground it it wasn't really shocking to me because I kind of envisioned a bigger game I just wish he would have scored one of those touchdowns yeah I agree and obviously just to the extent you had any remote doubt about like well we haven't really seen Patrick Mahomes go to Travis Kelsey we don't really know how that's (laughs) gonna work out you can let those go seven Catches on 10 targets for 109 yards and two scores. Travis Kelsey is good. That is my analysis. Going to the Steelers, I mean, Juju Smith-Schuster, man. I mean, we both have him. He's 13 of 19 targets for 121 yards and a score. I mean, I assume the answer to this is going to be no, but... Are you going to have him ranked as a wide receiver one going forward? It's tough not to, man. Like this this week, I want to say I moved him all the way up to like number 14. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm getting on borderline wide receiver one territory. Like, is this what I want to do? And I put all my DFS eggs in the Antonio Brown basket this week, which turned out to be a mistake. But yeah, Juju Smith-Schuster, man, he's benefiting from playing the slot, as we mentioned in the show so many times. Slot targets are worth more than the perimeter targets, so to know that Juju Smith is talented, to know that Antonio Brown requires so much attention from a defense, a lot of times they'll keep a safety shaded towards his side of the field. Juju Smith-Schuster is going to see single coverage, and if he can beat a slot nickel cornerback, he's he's going to make big plays, and you've seen that in back-to-back weeks. Um, He's the real deal, man. Yeah, no, absolutely could not agree more. Borderline wide receiver one. There's little reason out. There's room for two receivers, uh, you know, in this offense without question. Antonio Brown and Juju Smith-Schuster can both be wide receiver ones for a fantasy team. Uh, that's kind of the idea. We've talked already about James Conner, and Roethlisberger had the huge game and the perfect game script, which everybody kind of expected him to. 
Uh, Bucks 27, Eagles 21. Uh, we Again, we've talked about fits going on, but, I mean, what are we doing with Deshaun Jackson at this point? Catches all four of his targets for 129 yards and a touchdown. Are you moving him up your uh, rest of season rankings? I can't, unfortunately. Well, you can, Tags. You can do whatever you want. I, <laughs> I suppose I can do whatever I want, but I don't want to. There's just so many targets to go around, and it's it's tough for me to to think that he continues this. I, he's like one of those prime sell high players where it's like the snaps aren't really there. Ryan Fitzpatrick doesn't fit the skill set so much. Um, there's just there's so much talent on this team. There's no way that he's going to produce like this on a weekly basis, and um, I'm selling high. Yeah, no, me too. Certainly not. I, you look, a guy like basically, you're not going to have a 75 yard touchdown every week. That just doesn't happen. As much as if somebody could make it happen, Deshaun Jackson is one of like the top five guys to do it, but it's just not going to happen. Nor is Ryan Fitzpatrick going to play quite this well every week. But again, I agree. I just, he's going to be one of these guys that people are going to ask me about every week. And I'm just going to be like, nope, not moving him. I, I just do not feel confident whatsoever. Mike Evans obviously has the big game. Chris Godwin finds the end zone. OJ Howard finds the end zone. So it was just a nice game for everyone who plays for Tampa Bay. For the Eagles, um, obviously there's an ESPN report that Carson Wentz should be back next week, which pretty much helps everybody. Um, But what about Nelson Aguilar? Another 14 targets, 8 catches for 88 yards and a score. I mean, he's obviously much more valuable in PPR leagues, but I mean, he's he's really got to be moving up ranks in PPR leagues, right? I loved Aguilar this week. Uh, Tampa Bay was down two of their top three cornerbacks this week. Uh, Brent Grimes missed his second straight week. Vernon Hargraves went to the IR. So they were starting two rookies in the secondary. That was always a good thing. Uh, Jason Pierre Paul is dinged up, uh, so his pass rush wasn't going to be as good. Vita Vea, I want to say, was out for this game, if I'm not mistaken. So, like, there was a lot of things. Like, I I have no idea how the Eagles didn't win this game. I, I, I'm i still, like, dumbfounded in the fact that the Eagles lost to the Buccaneers. It's Fitz magic, baby. You can't stop him. You can't stop him. Yeah, like, with missing two of their t- top three cornerbacks, like, Nick Foles has just not really been that good um but yeah i love nelson Aguilar. i had him ranked as a wide receiver two this week um i think i had him number 18 overall so i like the matchup for him do i think it's going to be a consistent thing week over week no i don't and even with carson wentz coming back it's it's not like i think that he's going to be a consistently weekly fantasy performer but if you know mike wallace left this game early with an injury i didn't see that injury but i was told it, it could be some time Alshon Jeffrey is supposed to be coming back. If Alshon doesn't come in back right right away, I think Aguilar is going to continue to see these high target totals. But even with Alshon back, I don't think it's going to affect Aguilar too much because he plays a lot of the snaps out of the slot. So, um, yeah, Al- Aguilar is probably in my top 30 wide receivers for the rest of the season, but it's close. Like He's like right on that you know 28 to 32 range. Yeah, he is another guy for me, which I don't know. I have a hard time moving him up. Like, I've had him just every time I'm about to move him for rest of season to be a wide receiver three. I, I can't quite make it. I'm like, well, I feel like I need to leave him just outside of that range. This one might move the needle for me. But again, I just, you know, I don't know. Something about him, I, I just don't feel ready to trust him. For the running back, Ajayi left the game kind of early, but came back. He had a score. Do you think that Ajayi owners need to pick up Corey Clement? <sighs> Just as a hedge, you know, obviously a jive healthy is going to lead the way, but Clement looked good today. He did look good, and I think he looked good in limited time last year, but the problem is that the Eagles never seem to give Clement a shot, and I know he looked good today, but I think part of that has to do with Darren Sproles being out of the lineup and inactive, so I don't want to take too much away from one game. I mean, I suppose if there is someone that you want to handcuff Jay Ajayi with, I guess it's Corey Clement, um, but I still think this is going to be a timeshare, no matter who's back there. It's going to be a timeshare. And Jay Ajayi, you know, getting hurt. There was two different injuries I want to say that he suffered in this game. One was uh, to his back, and then the other one was to his leg because I saw him getting worked on the sideline. And it just made me feel like this is the this is the reason, like, people were scared of this guy. Like, he had health concerns, um, and if he can't hold up to a full workload, that's a problem. So I don't, I'm not saying that that's exactly what's happening, but the fact that he's injured twice, I think it just gives Doug Peterson more of a reason to stick with his timeshare. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Doug Peterson does not want to give Ajayi a ton of carries. No matter what he sort of says after that first game, he just doesn't want it. And I, I think if Clement can sort of be as effective as he's been, he really doesn't need to. So especially with the injury history, I agree. It's a little dicey of a situation. So we're running, starting to run a little long. So we're going to start moving at ludicrous speed going on here a little faster. Okay. Colts 21, Redskins 9. Go ahead, Tags. Just talk. Tell me what you want to take away from this game. Redskins blew this game. Um, they, they had a chance to win it and they the game script, the game plan was terrible. Um, like I don't, I don't say that much about Jay Gruden because I think he's actually a better offensive coordinator than most think. But Alex Smith didn't do his part this week. 
uh, Adrian Peterson. I mean, he had 11 carries, which isn't like the the worst part, but 20 yards on those 11 carries. I don't know what happened. Trent Williams did leave this game, the left tackle for the Redskins. So that's something to pay attention to because he's like a stud left tackle. He's like somebody that if he's missing, that offensive line is going to suffer a lot. Um, but Chris Thompson is obviously going to be involved with Alex Smith. We talked about that at the top of the show. So um, that's my biggest takeaway here. Jordan Reed is hurting Jamison Crowder for sure. I mean, on the cold side of the ball, Andrew Luck, Mm, it was a weird game in terms of he didn't need to do much. He only threw the ball 31 times, a couple picks, a couple touchdowns. The running game behind Marlon Mack, it seemed like they wanted to ease him back in and kind of work with a timeshare, but this could very well be what it is going forward because, as you, as you guys know, Frank Reich is from the Doug Peterson coaching tree, and if that's, if that's kind of how it works and he's learning from Doug Peterson, this could very well be like a three-headed timeshare with Naheem Hines playing the Darren Sproles role, then you have Marlon Mack playing – essentially the Jay Ajayi role, and then Wilkins playing Corey Clement. Uh, that could be how this turns out. Yeah, and if I'm a Marlon Mack owner, I'm pretty disappointed today. I mean, not because of the results of his game. I mean, he did have, obviously, a pedestrian 10 carries for 34 yards. But Jordan Wilkins looked better on his carries, 10 for 61, and Naheem Hines finds the end zone for the score. So at this point, you know, if I own Mack, there's just no way that I'm going to feel comfortable starting him uh, for the foreseeable future. I'm going to need to see more. And this game, frankly, it kind of you know, dulls my outlook on him for a little bit. Um, the only other thing I'm going to say is Eric Ebron finds the end zone three of four is again, we, I'm going to ask this every week. Who's the tight end to own in Indianapolis. It's still, it's, it's still definitely Jack Doyle. Uh, I know Ebron scored again, but, um, Ebron didn't even play 25% of the snaps today. He played, uh, 17 snaps. Jack Doyle played 58. I understand Ebron again. I mentioned it in the primer this past week saying that Ebron is going to be a matchup play where there's going to be weeks where you could use both of them, where we anticipate Andrew Luck throwing the ball a lot. And I thought this week was one of those weeks. Now, Eric Ebron scored, so that turned out to be correct. However, the way that they got there was not good. Like, it was not good at all because it was 31 attempts. If I knew Andrew Luck was throwing the ball 31 times, there's no way I would have recommended Ebron. Um, To know that he played 17 snaps, you guys should understand he's a sell high guy. He's a streaming target at best. Yeah, it, honestly, that is frankly the biggest thing is that you need to follow the snaps. Okay, it's not you can't look at the box score and just look at you know how many you know how many yards they had necessarily. You got to see how long they were on the field. And I agree, I'm still owning Doyle over Ebron, but you know, frankly, it's annoying to me to see Ebron sort of continue to do this on such limited playing time because I'd much rather Jack Doyle turn into a more reliable tight end. Uh, with the late games, Rams 34, Cardinals 0. The, the game was not as close as that score indicates, just to be clear. It was more like a 75-point spread. It was just preposterous the entire time. There's very little takeaway, although I, Larry Fitzgerald does leave the game with an injury. Again, we're recording this Sunday night, so we don't know. He left with a hamstring injury. The game was completely out of hand. It may be minor, but obviously that's something to monitor. Um, on the Rams side of the ball, Todd Gurley also left the game with cramping, so nothing to worry about. He had three touchdowns, so if you own Todd Gurley, you're probably pretty happy. Um, the only thing I'm going to point out is, look, I was really excited about Brandon Cooks even last week because even though he didn't have a great game, he saw eight targets. Sammy Watkins had eight targets once last year, so I was sort of going to be like, oh, look, it's going to be Brandon Cooks. Nobody worry. He did see eight targets again, which is fantastic, except this time he turned them into seven catches for 159 yards. I'm pretty bullish on Brandon Cooks going forward. Are you good with him, Tags, or are you a little worried? Because, again, Robert Wood's still heavily involved. Cooper Cup's still heavily involved. Uh, I'm, I'm all in on Brandon, on Brandon Cooks, honestly. Like, I was worried, and then like the, mo- the, the more I've seen of this offense and the fact that he had a brutal matchup against Patrick Peterson this week, um, I was worried about Brandon Cooks this week. Like, he was a wide receiver three in my rankings, but after seeing nine targets, 159 yards, in this, it's, it's just clear that Sean McVay knows how to call an offense, and he knows how to create mismatches for his players, and he's doing that consistently. So to know that you have a weapon like Brandon Cooks with a mastermind like Sean McVay, I probably was just too low on him in the preseason. I think I ended up with him as uh, my number 19 wide receiver, and um, it appears that he might be on his way to another top 12 finish. Yeah, no, I agree. I'm very bullish on him. Um, I was kind of coming in for rest of season rankings. I, you know, I just, I think talent wins out. I did not see the comparisons to Sammy Watkins, who came over in the middle sort of of the preseason cooks. You know, they gave Cooks the deal. I think they wanted him to be a focal point. So I'm I'm a big buyer in him. With regard to the Cardinals, ugh, I mean, what what do you, are you are you nervous about David Johnson, I assume? Oh, I, I was nervous before the season. I told people this that their offensive line is terrible. Sam Bradford presents no rushing ability. They don't have to set a QB spy, so it's an extra man in the box essentially. Low scoring offense. I'm I'm and I'm not doing this to brag at all because I feel bad because I know I understand why people wanted to draft David Johnson. The guy is like a phenomenal talent, but his talent's going to waste. Like I don't own David Johnson outside of a dynasty league. Yeah, and I agree. And frankly, you know, the the difference is forget about how terrible the offense is. They're not lining him 
outside of the backfield anymore, right? Yeah, that's a that's a big problem. All right, last year it was 36% of his snaps. I know in week one it was 14%. I don't know the numbers exactly from this one, but from what I saw of it, it did not look to be very many, and that's just going to kill his value. So if you own David Johnson, there's really not much you can do because you're going to be selling low. There's nobody who's going to buy him at preseason value, but you know at this point it's I, I'd be worried. Um, 49ers 30, Lions 27. This game was still going on as we started the podcast. So Matt Breida, 11 carries, 138 yards for a touchdown. Do we finally have our lead back in San Francisco, or is this one going to just be a timeshare going forward? I still think it's a timeshare. I think it's going to it's going to come down to like the game script and all things like that. Now, I was a little disappointed by Alfred Morris's performance. I felt like this was a week where he could have kind of capitalized on his starting role, and he did receive more touches than Matt Breida. But Breida broke a 66-yard touchdown. I think it was in the third or the fourth quarter. I I can't remember when that actually happened, but I was watching the game as that happened and it was, it was a good run and the way he finished it was solid, like running behind his blockers and like manipulating the defender. Um, so Matt Breida, I mean, I think he's more of a three down back than Alfred Morris. So I guess it does lend a little bit towards him winning this timeshare. Uh, it just comes, I, I, I still think it comes down to game script though. I think they're going to want Alfred Morris still to get his 10 to 12 touches per game. Yeah, I completely agree. And he had 14 carries in this game. So it's not as if they got away from him even after that run. So, it, you know, for me, again, I think it's a time share. I agree. I kind of thought Morris is going to be the guy in this one. Um, I kind of think that's what Shanahan wanted. But again, you can't deny their production. But I think both guys are going to be useful in the right matchup. Uh, and next week they're playing the Chiefs. So that's a pretty good matchup for basically the entire offense. In terms of the Lions, again, Kenny Galladay, just uh, six catches, 89 yards and a touchdown. I mean, he's got to be sort of somebody who you're kind of thinking about in the wide receiver three range at this point, don't you think? I'm selling Kenny Galladay, um, and I know that so many people are going to be on me about that because Galladay, he had a good week one, and it wasn't garbage time and this and that. So my issue here is that you need to you need to pick your spot, okay? And the, what I mean by that is that Golden Tate plays a completely different position. He's going to get his out of the slot. That's his role. He's going to get that. So you need to pick your poison between Marvin Jones and Kenny Galladay. And I'm unwilling to say that Kenny Galladay is the preferred play because there are not going to be three top 30 wide receivers on a team. That's not going to happen, guys. I understand Kenny Galladay is going to have weeks, which means he's going to be a streamer in in matchups where it's like, okay, we can predict Marvin Jones is going to see this guy, yada, yada. Marvin Jones had a good game. Golden Tate had a good game. This just happened to be one of those games. And I actually had Matt Stafford as a top six quarterback play this week. I liked all these receivers this week. I don't think that's going to be the case going forward. I think he's going to, I think you'll see two fantasy relevant wide receivers. It helps that he's not targeting tight ends like Luke Wilson, Michael Roberts. They combined for two targets today. That obviously helps Kenny Galladay, but I just don't see them scoring three touchdowns every single week. Um, Kenny Galladay, he's kind of like the sell high guy. If you, if you find someone willing to pay a top 30 wide receiver price, I would sell. I think he's a wide receiver four. I think he's a good wide receiver four and one that has more upside than most. And if something were to happen to Marvin Jones, Kenny Galladay is suddenly like an every week wide receiver two. But it's just tough. It's just tough to see him like continually put up these numbers. Yeah, no, I, look, I, I think I'm more of a buyer than you are. And again, I, I everything you're saying makes total sense. But I kind of think you might be able to support all three guys. Now, I think there are going to be weeks where only two of them. I mean, Golden Tate is pretty much a reliable guy. And I think there are going to be weeks where only one of Galladay and Jones gets there. But again, you know, first of all, next week they're playing the Patriots. They're going to be behind. They're probably going to need to get all three guys involved. I think there are going to be enough games, especially with that defense, where they're going to need to be throwing a ton. And I think all three guys can get it. So for me, again, it's probably in the end, wherever we come out on our rest of season rankings, it's probably not going to be drastically different, right? We're probably going to be, I'm going to probably have them as a very low end wide receiver three you're probably going to have him as a mid-tier wide receiver four in the end but I think I'm probably a little more bullish than you are all right moving on Broncos 20 Raiders 19 I mean tags Royce Freeman finds the end zone here eight carries for 28 yards and touchdown but Philip Lindsay 14 carries 107 yards he adds in a catch for four yards I mean how high are we going on Lindsay at this point? <laughs> I um in my primer, I, I said it openly. I said, you know, I liked Royce Freeman this week as like a low end RB two, and that Lindsay was like an RB four type where I, I I wanted to see it again before I believed it. And I said right at the end, I said, I am admittedly probably too low on him because I did like Philip Lindsay, but I also never thought that there would be another game this year where Philip Lindsay would see fifteen carries. Um, like I feel like he's a good timeshare back, but he's like proving to be more than that. Um, it's a problem for Royce Freeman, but at the same time, Royce Freeman is a problem for Philip Lindsay because Royce Freeman is extremely talented. So this is an ugly one, man. I, I don't like the way that the Broncos like are kind of doing this. I feel like this team should have been in no position to lose this game. Now, granted, they did end up winning on a last second field goal, 
but they should have never even been this close with Oakland. I believe this team is completely mismanaged. And it's not to say that Philip Lindsay is not a good running back, but I think it's going to be extremely in, uh, like unpredictable week to week where like Lindsay, do I think that like over the last two weeks, it's hard to say that Lindsay's not an every week, you know, low end RB two, high end RB three, but I am, I cannot rank him like confidently as such. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And again, this is a game that I, I wasn't able to fully pay attention to. We were getting ready for the podcast as this game is still going on. But I agree. I, I didn't. I was shocked when I saw the box score that he got 14 carries versus Freeman's eight. Um, Look, I, I like Lindsey. I, I really do. I think he's a good player. I think he is going to be involved specifically in PPR leagues. But there's just no way that I'm going to come into this and be like, yeah, this is a guy I'm going to be starting every single week in standard leagues. Not at this point. I don't know what the Broncos are doing. And I completely agree with you. I was shocked that they were losing this game and basically should have lost this game if they didn't pull it out at the very end. But it it was pretty surprising to me. So, I mean, I'm going to take a closer look at this. I'm going to watch it tomorrow on Game Pass. But again, it's somebody that, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not really overly excited about Lindsay. I am somewhat but not at a point where I'm like, yep, here's a reliable RB2 going forward. With the wide receivers tags a little bit weird, Sanders has the big game. He catches all four of his targets for 96 yards, but Demarius Thomas gets 11 targets. Uh, he only comes down with five of them for 18 yards. I think last year, last week, you said you'd rather own Sanders over Thomas, and I assume that still holds. It still does, and I know he only had four targets and Demarius had 11, but they were bad targets like in terms of the way that they were using him on those targets. Emmanuel Sanders has looked fantastic. Basically, anytime he's been targeted, he's does he caught every ball that came to him 96 yards in the contest like his targets are the ones that matter because again he's seeing the slot matchups with Cortland Sutton coming on and playing the perimeter Emmanuel Sanders has been in the slot over 50 percent of the time and that's very valuable for a guy that was able to produce in the perimeter that's why the thing is is like people need to understand slot receivers are what they are like guys like Danny Amendola Trent Taylor Cole Beasley these are slot only wide receivers Emmanuel Sanders was able to play on the perimeter like he was able to beat coverage on the perimeter so when you move a player like that into the slot things just come to him easier like it will be easier he's going to see nickel cornerbacks guys that don't play every snap he's going to be seeing safeties in coverage they cannot keep up with a player to of his talent level so Emmanuel Sanders is still my favorite wide receiver to own in Denver yeah, absolutely. I, I I do agree. I'm a big Thomas fan, but at this point, I, I it would be too hard for me to get away from Sanders, and you certainly convinced me last week, and that's where I have it ranked, and that's where I'm going to have it ranked going forward. On the Raiders, Amari Cooper, ten all 10 of his targets <laughs> for 116 yards. He finally got involved. We love him. Are you totally bullish on Cooper going forward? I love Amari, man. I'm never going to—I I will never, ever give up Amari Cooper, but I will, um, I will say this, is that you're never going to be able to trust him with Derek Carr as his quarterback. You're never going to be able to trust the matchups. Like unless, unless basically they completely learn, like they understood where they went wrong and we need to get him the ball because the offensive coordinator basically came out after the game last week and said, yeah, Amari had, had what three targets. They were like, yeah. And he's like, you know, we went and watched the film and he was open. So I don't, I don't know why Derek Carr didn't throw him the ball. Like that's something we need to address And Amari Cooper. That's the thing. This matchup was brutal. Uh, against Bradley Roby, against Chris Harris Jr. Like these are, this is a great cornerback duo. And Amari Cooper caught all ten of his targets for 116 yards. Look good doing it too. Uh, Amari is a phenomenal player. But am I going to simply dismiss everything that's happened over the last few last two years? No, I'm not because Derek Carr has been extremely hit or miss. Derek Carr actually looked pretty solid today. I, 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 he's not the reason they lost this game. He only three incompletions the whole game. Yeah, he looked solid today. Like I watched a lot of that game and he looked solid. Um, he's not the reason they lost this game. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I, I really, really happy to see this out of Cooper. And he got off to a slow start. I don't think he had a, I'm not sure if he had a catch in the first quarter. So I was looking like, okay, this is going to be a, but he looked awesome. Um, He played angry car, you know, for the most part, he, he's got like happy feet a little bit. He looks like he gets scared a bit, but for the most part, look, he knows if they are going to succeed, it's going to be through Cooper. So I, uh, you know, I'm going to take a look going forward, but again, I, you know, we both love his talent and I think he's going to, he's going to be good. They take on the dolphins next week. Yeah, Xavier Howard, I don't I don't think he's shadowing Cooper. And honestly, he goes in the slot and there's no way Xavier Howard falls him into the slot, which means Minka Fitzpatrick is going to match up with him. So that should be another matchup. They target him, but we'll see if they actually do. All right, final game tags. Pats at Jaguars. Jaguars win 31-20. Just give me your takeaways. Go for it. Other than I'm the happiest man in the world because I'm a Jets fan and I live in New England. Yeah, that's terrible. Um I, I yeah, I don't feel sorry for you at all. Like no. ever. Um <laughs> I get anyways. But uh, Tom Brady, he did what he could. I think I think the Patriots are basically a team that without Tom Brady, they're a mess. Um, and like I mean that because like you have Rob Gronkowski, and then it's like from there, it's like who do we have? We're, we're we're like putting a puzzle together, trying to figure out which 
pieces go where you have running backs that are dinged up concussions knee issues whatever suspensions there's so many problems with this team uh the defense looked terrible like the jags the jags basically didn't take their foot off the throttle this reminded me of the playoff game between the two but the jags this time they didn't take their foot off they kept throwing the ball into the third and fourth quarter and granted bortles he threw four touchdowns in 377 yards so obviously they found the mismatches keelan cole looked fantastic oh. um the dd westbrook's touchdown was stupid like there's no yeah. way that that should have been a touchdown <laughs> but whatever um i just think we're seeing the fall of new england i don't think like i didn't predict them to be in the super bowl this year and i know that people said that that was dumb but i stand by that i just don't think that i don't think they have enough talent in the team and brady's not in his prime anymore he's obviously towards the end and knowing that they're lacking options knowing that the offensive line is is not good like they losing two tackles this offseason losing their starting guard uh, in the preseason it's just too much. So, um, unfortunately, I think, I, I mean, it depends on how you look at it, right? I think we're starting to see the fall of the New England Patriots. I think that that is an absolutely fair point, and I'm probably going to disagree as hard as I can, only because I've thought that, I feel like, in the beginning of the season, for the last four years, every time I'm like, oh, they're going to be in the playoffs for sure. Like, that's yeah. going to be there. No, 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 of course, but I'm not kidding. I, I, if Right now, if you're making me choose, I'd still pick them to be in the Super Bowl because I think by the end I agree without Brady they're a terrible team and I've thought that frankly forever as good as a coach as Belichick is but I really think by the end Belichick is going to figure it out somehow and that they're still going to be able to make it and I think Brady will start playing better uh, again I mean I'm, I believe me I hope you're right but I think frankly that they're going to figure it out Chris Hogan obviously was quiet for most of the game and then by the end of the game catches the two touchdown passes so as long as Edelman is out you know you can feel good anything on the Jaguar side of the ball are you trusting Keelan Cole at this point i mean it's hard not to um he looked really good and the matchup in week one was tougher than people thought um against janoris jenkins so i didn't want to take too much away from that but i did all i also thought that bill belichick would take away keelan cole in this matchup but they did not shadow him with stefan gilmore uh, i don't know why they didn't it really made no sense to me but it, it's what it is what it is and they paid for it so um keelan cole is going to have better matchups in the future and i think like today he proved to me that he honestly he is their best receiver and it's not all that close Correct. I own tons of shares of him because I, I love the talent uh, and I'm glad, you know, when, with an off season with the whole playbook under his belt, there was all that talk about how last year he didn't even know the plays. He just kind of running out there like, you know, with drawing plays on dirt in the ground and somehow he was still producing. So now with a full off season under his belt, I was really excited about him and he made some silly catches today. So it was really good to see. All right, tags. We have done it. We have survived. We went a little long. That's my fault, but we have survived. Thank you for joining me on your birthday. I hope it was great, and I hope you enjoy Sunday Night Football. It was fun, man. I just I just witnessed uh, ta- so the uh, the games on the background. Tavon Austin just had a long sixty plus yard touchdown. Oh, baby! Well, I'm going to turn it on right now, <laughs> and on behalf of myself and Mike Taglier, uh, have a great rest of your week and enjoy your football. I just wanted you to watch me dissolve.